Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me is, thankfully, because it is a scorching week in Montreal, we have the coolest cucumber on earth, Mackenzie. Yay, I'm a cucumber. Yes, that's the thing to take out from this sentence. I was going to go with, yay, I'm a cucumber, or it's only hot because you're here. Hell yeah, I like both of those. (laughs) It's It's better than BC. BC? It's like 45 degrees there. Oh, right. I People saw that are recently. Dying. Yeah, I saw that recently. Apparently, in the last week, they broke the record five times for the hottest temperatures in Canada. Look at that. Montreal breaking records. No, for BC. Once. Oh, well, Canada said, look at that. Canada breaking record. I don't know anymore. <laughs> The heat has addled my brain. Yeah, exactly. If, uh, for whatever reason, listeners feel that we are rambling in this one, it's because it is very hot and humid. So we'll try to make it as coherent as possible. If, uh, for whatever reason, we don't come out as coherent, just send us an email and say, like, yo, this is, I I have no idea what you guys are saying. And then next episode, we'll do it with ice strapped to our chests. Or we'll just keep it in the archives forever and never really release it it's fine we have to release it we have to get out of the confederation in the 1800 someday yeah so like as Mackenzie mentioned right we've been leading up to confederation for a long time and we discussed it i agree that it takes a long time to get there we're in the final stages like just to give listeners a preview we are covering today and next episode two forms of literary nationalism that kind of represent what's going on in canada leading up to confederation and then we're going to be covering the kind of creation of British Columbia. And I want to talk about British Columbia before talking about Confederation because British Columbia will become a major impetus behind Confederation and post-Confederation product uh, projects. And we've got uh, Thomas Darcy McGee. Yeah, and he's also, he's a father of Confederation and also a, also a literary figure. Also? also a literary figure. So it felt natural to kind of talk about him. <laughs> Are you the villain separate. from The Kingsman? Yes, I'm Samuel L. Jackson. With uh, a lisp. Yeah, Thomas <laughs> And then we have two episodes for consideration, for con- confederation. Consideration, yeah, cool. Two episodes leading up to confederation and then the actual talk of confederation. And then we've got a two-parter on one John A. McDonald. Oof, yeah. Well, well I, I can't wait to lead up, honestly, to John A. Because I think you brought up an interesting one when you're saying it might be interesting to do two parts, right, with one... Focusing on the achievements and triumphs. And then the second one, focusing on, like, the shady shit. Oh, yeah. Um, The the faults, the the misbehaviors, the crimes, like, the straight-up just crimes and war crimes and genocides. Not war crimes, because, well, I don't know. It depends what you define as war, I guess. Oh, yeah, we can... The hate crimes, cultural crimes. Just the list keeps on going. Statues. Presidential schools. Yep. Uh, oh my god, did you see that one recently? I mean, it's a bit hard to avoid about the residential schools. So, well, it seems like there's a new one every day, which is good. Like, we want to start learning all these things. Well, not good, but you know, it's good that we're finally starting to learn about these things and see more of them in the news. Oh yeah, I definitely. Mean, Before... It is not good that it happens. It's horrible. No, of course not. It's horrible that it was hidden for so long. Before we get started into our episode topic, just a quick reminder that you can support the show. Um, You can support us through Patreon, through donations, through the recommended reading page. There's all kinds of ways, right? Actually, this week, uh, we got a new donation, right, from Isabel. Yes, we got a dono. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. So thank you very much, Isabel. I know you listen to the show every so often, so uh, thank you very much. And we always like to thank our patrons. So Craig, Jessica, Elise, all those wonderful patrons, thank you very much. It allows us to keep the show going, and it tells us that you actually like what we produce. So, it tells us you like what I produce specifically. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, support Mac. Support yeah. Mac's endeavors and follies. <laughs> My endeavors and follies? Speaking of which, we'll probably have an episode of Pop Canada soon soonish yeah yeah we should uh, so look yeah, out for that soon. one uh, on the soon, patreon soon, 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 way. 
So today, in kind of the spirit of leading up to Confederation. And seeing as we just came past St. Jean Baptiste Day. Mm -hmm, absolutely very relevant. A complete coincidence, might I add. <laughs> we're just that good. Apparently, yeah. It's, we're meant to do this episode. So we're going to be addressing a literary figure who was very well known in his time and was actually considered to be French Canada's national bard for his era, right, in the 18th. 1950s and 60s, but who today kind of honestly fell into obscurity, right? In Montreal, at least, at best, he has a street named after him and a metro station, but I don't think many people know who he actually was. Um, so yeah, we're, today, if you saw the title of the episode, we're going to be talking about Octave Crémazie, who, as we said, was very important in his time. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of set the mood, right, I want to start with an excerpt from a letter that he wrote while he was exiled in France, and we'll get to the reasons of his exile a bit later, but this is towards the end of his life, right? So he writes, the writers in Canada find themselves in the same situation as writers in the Middle Ages. Their pens cannot provide for their barest needs unless they get involved in politics. And God knows the long-winded speeches we get from the political class. So <laughs> I, I think this kind of sets the ideas that we're going to be playing with throughout this episode of where Kim Z positions himself as a writer and just the general sentiments that are brewing in Canada around this time, right? Um, or at least the ideas that we have about Canadians. By the way, when we're talking about French Canada, right, and Octave Kimaizy's place in it, mostly at the time, it was considered Quebec, right, what we now consider Quebec. While right. there were French populations outside of Quebec, they were not particularly considered within this idea of French Canada and French Canadian nationalism that would emerge yeah. time and time again throughout Canadian history. And still emerging. Absolutely. For a variety of reasons, right? The um, 101 rewrite. Mm-hmm. And so you get this idea, right, that for Kimazi and others, it's pretty much related to Canada East or Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, the Métis in Manitoba, the Franco-Ontarians, they weren't necessarily called Franco-Ontarians at the time, but that subset, the Acadians in New Brunswick, none of them are really considered in this or much uh, thought of. Anyway, I do. Yeah, I on. find it interesting his quote, ref like, because uh, this is his quote, right? The writers in Canada, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. He wrote it in French originally, but I tran yeah. it was translated, yeah. I find it interesting he's making a parallel to the Middle Ages. I don't okay. know. It's, it stands out to me as a sort of idea of what, because writers are always, writers, authors, etc. They've always been getting involved in politics. It's not like it's anything new, but I think it's interesting that he brings special attention to it now. Yeah, interesting. Um, we can get into a bit of that why, but do you have any initial thoughts as to why that would be emerging now? Well, I mean, as we've seen, again, isn't in Canada. So he's writing... He's writing 18... in the 1850s, mostly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is just after... What's the, what's the official act again? The Act, of, the Union? act of Union? Yeah. yeah, exactly. This is only 10 years after that, 10, 12 years. And it's still an important thing, and they're still sort of processing how they're moving through it. This is a major transitional period for Canada, so obviously politics is going to be on the forefront, especially in French Canada, Canada, Canada because again, yeah. we have one of my least favorite people who caused so many problems mm -hmm. that we're still feeling throughout Canada today, Lord Durham. Oh yeah, and we'll definitely, we're not going to develop him all that much. We did a full episode on him but we're definitely going to bring him up. Just because... so we can beat him down. <laughs> I don't know, because in a sense, right, rereading Octave Kimaizi and seeing some of the criticism both contemporary to him and today, it shines a slightly different light on Durham. I don't, I, I must say, I don't agree with much of what Durham represented. Uh, but there are certain elements of his criticism and his insight into French Canada, limited as it was, as it may be, or was rather. Uh -huh. I think it does shine a new light on him that I think would be very interesting to bring up uh, later in the episode yeah for sure so just a for bit sure of there, Sorry. <laughs> just a bit of context on Kremazi himself right so he was born claude joseph olivier Kremazi. he was called octave by his mother and the name kind of stuck because who has time to say three full names and he was born in quebec city in 1827 and he studied at what was called Le Petit Seminaire, so he studied uh, under the priesthood, from 1836 to 1843, right? And so this kind of indicates to us the kind of 
small bourgeois upbringing that he had. He was able to get an education for almost 10 years, which is very uh, significant at the time. And it would definitely show in much of his thought and writing later on, right? And just the general endeavors that he produced, right? He had a bookstore, he was a poet, he was very engaged in what he considered to be French Canada's plights. So after having spent time at the Seminaire, he would actually exactly in 1844, so only a year later, open his bookstore in Quebec. And what was special about this one is that it sold a variety of imported books and goods. That was kind of a specialty. He would sometimes go for business to places like France, which he had a very, very uh, particular fondness for um, as a political entity. This was right around the time when the Second Empire was forming under Napoleon III. And he loved that, by the way, we can get into that a bit later, but he loved what that represented for the glory of France and its kind of return to a heightened state, so to speak. Yeah, Quebec and France have always had an interesting relationship together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's one that will be sparked anew uh, in Kim Aziz's lifetime, as we'll see. So yeah, in 1844, he would open this bookstore, uh, which we'll definitely talk about also later, because there were other important movements that would come out of that specific bookstore. And his first verse would be published in 1849 in small magazines. And by 1858, so nine years later, he was already being called the National Bard of French Canada. So we're going to develop more on his life a bit later, but that's generally speaking who he is. Mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of interesting, right? So you were mentioning before, uh, just at the start of the episode, that during the 1850s, we're just coming out of the aftermath of the Act of Union, which is a direct result of Durham's report and such things. Do you know much about this period in Canadian history, like what's going on exactly? Or Because uh, I know a lot of your knowledge of Canadian history is based on right the high school education that you got of it. Mm -hmm. You didn't really study it beyond that in university. And I feel like a lot of people skip this time, even though it's a really important transitional period in the country's history. Right? Yeah, we, I feel like there was mentions of it, but it was never a big focus. We probably had mentions of like, oh, this thing started. Mm -hmm. But when, we, when those things were mentioned, it was more because of this thing happened. And from it, we began to see the rise of Sir John A. Macdonald. Yeah. Okay. Not because of the event itself. It was more about what the event paved the way for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's definitely an interesting point, right? Because McDonald would indeed rise out of this period. He gained increasing political prominence during this time. Mm -hmm. So just as a quick recap, after the Act of Union, essentially you had equal representation of both Canada East and Canada West, and each of them had their own representatives, which co-governed the entire province of Canada, of United Canada, so to speak. Now... The problem with this is that it led to a, a quite a political deadlock, right? Because each of them had a certain equality, which for all intents and purposes is good. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is it often led to just stalemates in terms of debates, in terms of what to actually do uh, about a variety of things. So you would mostly end up with a democratic process that was going nowhere. And that's the world in which exactly as you're saying, Johnny McDonald, along with all these other politicians, including his famous cohort in French Canada, Georges Etienne Cartier, that's the world in which they would grow up in politically speaking. Mm -hmm. right. So in terms of official right, uh, structures, there is equality between French and English Canada. But it doesn't, like after the Act of Union, it doesn't really change the actual alienation that a lot of French Canadians felt at the time, right? The Durham Report, instead of slowly assimilating the French Canadians, it just kind of keeps them in this weird position of subordination in which the full structure doesn't really change. It's a lot of British or French people acting like uh, according to British standards who are in power. The French Canadians are often still the lowly workers. There's a language barrier that stops a lot of French Canadians from rising, rising to... up. Exactly. So... There's all kinds of things that don't really change. So it's kind of weird to talk about this period. And I understand why a lot of people skip it because nothing really happens. 
And it's interesting to me to talk about it exactly because nothing really happened. Okay, it, right, right, right. Do, do, do you see what I mean, right? So Durham report, Durham's report is often hailed as this thing in which, oh, you know, there were these, is this great change. And indeed, to a certain extent, it was, right? You got a complete change of political structures. But nothing actively changed until much later, right? A lot of okay. these, a lot of these uh, revolutionary movements that you saw under Papineau and all that and Mackenzie kind of died yeah, down. And that's it. It's, did you say my name? Yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> I like to remind myself that you're there. Exactly. <laughs> In my heart yeah. and otherwise. Mm -hmm. so, so basically this kind of dream of French Canadian liberty and freedom that we saw under these revol uh, revolts in the 1830s kind of is still there. The reasons for it still exist, but it just kind of has nowhere to go now. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the attempts kind of died out. And this can apply also, by the way, we're talking politically speaking and socially speaking, but this could apply just as much for cultural perspectives. Right? And this is the world in which Kimazi is raised in and grows up in. So to have someone who is French Canadian, who's well-educated, but who doesn't necessarily have a market for his poetry, who doesn't necessarily have a great place for his bookstore or his ideas, it's mm -hmm. extremely difficult within that context to actually be successful, right? But yeah, that's kind of it. The United Canada becomes more of a symbolic coalition more than anything else. They're still trying to feel out what this means, you know, and they're still trying to figure out, does this really mean anything? This whole act of union, are they really a union? Mm -hmm. One Absolutely. territory still obviously holds much more power over the other one. Mm -hmm. and is trying to get even more power, right? Mm -hmm. So this is around the time where in English Canada, because their population starts to get much larger than French Canada, because that's the kind of immigration that's encouraged, um, that's in this time where you're, st where you're going to start to see calls for rep by pop, mm -hmm. which in a certain sense makes sense. It'll allow people to actually advance projects much more efficiently, but it also clearly has an ideological and racialized agenda behind it. Um, oh yeah. So do with that as you will. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's, again, it's kind of something that's interesting to think about as the roots of a lot of things that you're gonna see post-Confederation, because that's always an eternal debate within the Canadian political structure is how much authority do the individual provinces have and how much authority do the federal institutions have, right? There's also like, there's, they have, they're scrambling to figure these things out and trying to figure something out because their neighbor to the south isn't exactly the friendliest one right now. Now Absolutely. Canada and America are known for having this long-standing alliance, friendship, etc. You know, we're known as long-standing allies. But way back in the day, things weren't that way. There was a lot of fear and talk about annexation mm -hmm. of Canada into the U.S. Absolutely. That's a wonderful segue because right around this time as well, you have... What can I say? I read the notes. I know what to do. <laughs> I follow my script and cues. There you go. But uh, it, it is a wonderful segue because we didn't talk about this on the episode in which Craig was on, but it was right around contemporary to that, uh, around the kind of changes that you see post-Active Union. So in 1849, you get what's called the Annexation Manifesto, which is signed by about 350 people, mm -hmm. mostly English Tories and French Canadian nationalists, which it seems like a really weird mix, uh, considering that they're constantly at odds with each other in ca the Canadian political political sphere and still are to this day. But you saw this manifesto that was created as a kind of way to integrate into the American sphere. Mm -hmm. right? A lot of people, right, mostly, as I say, merchants and nationalists thought that being with the United States would be more economically and politically beneficial. Right? Because there was this perception that the Americans were a much greater economic power. It was much more dynamic, which to a certain extent it was. Yeah. Especially that it was, you know, you saw it much more than Canada. It was moving west so much more rapidly as this kind of uh, economic expansion was happening. And for French Canadians, you had this perception that the states had much more, the individual states, I mean, had much more individual rights within this larger federal polity. Mm -hmm. So... 
for that for both of these seemingly disparate groups of Tories and nationalists, you had in the U.S. this kind of idealized idea of what it could offer, much more than anything the British Empire in Canada could. It helped also their cause that they were in the middle of an economic crisis, but uh, that's a, once again this kind of weird tension that's happening in Canada, right? As a place that doesn't quite know what it wants to be. Uh, what should we be a part of? Is it the British Empire? Is it America? Our own thing, right? And so all these questions kind of lead to increasingly this confederation uh, discussion. Right? Everybody just keeps asking questions and eventually the question gets asked, why don't we our own country? Absolutely. So it... Th- we, we, it comes up a lot on the show, right? But you're, you, you, you keep mentioning it and it's definitely relevant, but one of the great questions of Canadian history and politics is, you know, how are we going to do this peacefully, right? Or yeah. how are we going to do this in a less radical way than our neighbors? Well, well, um, well less, I find it's about them. It, it wasn't about them finding a less radical way. It was about finding a way, how can we do this to the greatest benefit to Canada? Mm-hmm, absolutely. You know, Which, it was, we're not just being peaceful because, oh, we don't want to fight or we're too chicken. It's, if anybody who's seen a hockey game knows, Canadians can be very violent when we want to be. <laughs> when, the, when, when the action requires it, you know, like we'll get in there and we'll do our part. Mm-hmm. I mean, we did, got you, in, did you we, see what was happening after the Montreal Canadiens game on, um, what was it, last Thursday? I live near the Bell Centre. I heard true. it. That's true. Yeah, wonderful stuff. For those who don't know, there was a Montreal Canadiens game in which... uh, They made it to the finals, baby. Yep, and people got real rowdy for no reason. They flipped the police car. Yeah, wonderful Well, even more than that, like in a more like historical sense... For sure. Canada is, was one of the few countries that was in in World War II from day one. Uh Uh-huh, yep. Historically speaking, they waited a couple of hours before they declared war just to show that they could declare war whenever they wanted. But then they said, of course, we're going to go fight with Britain. Yep. Like when when the time comes to fight, they'll fight. They just looked at the considered confederation and they said, hey, we don't need to fight. The fight's not worth it in this situation. Mm -hmm. That would not be of the the greatest benefit to Canada. Right, absolutely. I think that really is a potent... Uh, point to mention. So you have at this moment, right? It, the, the the annexation manifesto, by the way, never goes anywhere. The, <laughs> yeah. the British, the British Thank never God. really take it seriously. Well, because they went, what should we be a part of? And then somebody said, why do we have to be a part of anything? Why can't we be our own place? Exactly. So instead of completely changing the structure, you kind of change the perspective mm-hmm. in a sense. Change right? the idea at its very root. Right. And so. One of the reasons why the United Canadian Project, as we understand it in the 1850s, lasts historically very little time is because we realize very quickly that it's going to lead to an eternal kind of deadlock if something doesn't change, right? And so there is increasingly these kind of talks to include other provinces in British North America and say, Mm -hmm. okay, well, is there anything that we can do to kind of not only be stronger together in the face of the American threat or perceived threat of the Americans, but we also kind of want to actually be our own thing that can hold its own ground, right? Politically, ideologically, both within the British Empire and in the North American continent. So, and you know, it just makes sense to ask everybody like, hey, we're all a little kind of similar right now. Why don't we... Why don't we be similar together instead of separately? Yep. Now, places like Newfoundland are going to say no to that very fast. Um, Yeah, fair enough. I was listening actually to a podcast the other day in which uh, someone from Newfoundland was on it. It was kind of interesting because he mentioned something that I hadn't really thought of. So uh, I don't know if you knew this, but Newfoundland only joined Canada in 1949. And he was saying something really interesting. He was like, you know, a lot of Newfoundlanders feel that they kind of got shafted and that they were forced into this Mm -hmm. confederation. And a lot of them still don't consider themselves Canadian. So you have these tensions that exist elsewhere in Canada. We tend to focus a lot on the Francophone element and the native element, which is definitely there. But it's interesting to think, it made me think about this other element that 
doesn't get as much play either in this whole discussion of what exactly is the confederation project long after confederation happened and why is it so important we'll get more into it later i just i think it's kind of interesting you know i'm having thoughts now and i want to put them out there before i mm-hmm. forget about them later and we're taking the notes and we'll probably yeah. talk a bit about it in regards to Aktev when we finally get into him <laughs> yeah 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 we're, well we're coming up to him i just wanted to set a lot of the scene right because there's a lot that goes on in the 1850s mm-hmm. and because confederation is such a big deal yeah. in canada because of what it actually means in the way we go against it because canada before then was a place very used to being traded the land the people you know first we started as a british place and a french place and then got traded to britain and then mm-hmm. a large parts of it was rupert's land and then mm-hmm. that got sold and we were a country that traded hands for hundreds of years and we were okay with it and Absolutely. then finally we stood up we said no we are not going to be traded we are not going to be put in the hands of somebody else the safest hands are our own the hands that will best lead our country and take care of us but it's it's kind of interesting right the idea of trade oh okay we're 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 getting really into it but i i really find this interesting right this idea of trade is really interesting because that whole idea still underpins a lot of the post-confederation project right exactly right the rupert's land that you mentioned right that whole section of western canada or the prairies as we call them today was intrinsically tied to wanting to develop that and trade with that before the americans move north that Mm -hmm. was explicit in a lot of the project long before we actually moved into there well wasn't that like it was get the prairies make a railroad from sea to sea and there was a third thing wasn't there and that was like the three main super points of the bna act yeah well it's interesting uh what was it there was a Ah, oh, there was a, there's many like three main points of, yeah, like, the, of course. <laughs> like it depends how you look at it, but there was one that was more from a, it reminds me of a sociological perspective more than anything else where the BNA act, or at least Canada's goal at that moment was make sure the French stay in, make sure the natives don't exist somehow and make sure the Americans stay out. <laughs> like Jesus that was Christ. kind of. I, I, I forget which author mentioned it like that, but that was kind of the three main points that he stu- that stood out to him. It was very funny when I read it. My God. <laughs> Not Sounds wrong. All right. Um, all right. So now that we've set the stage. Yeah. So one last thing that I wanted to mention, right? Uh, so you're saying before that France and Quebec always had this interesting relationship. Oh, yeah. So the... Well, even now. Absolutely. Even now, culturally, much more than anything else, right? We, well, it's also the fact that, you know, people that immigrate from France are sort of told to come here and they're sort of like, there's, they, they say that there's incentives and all these other things oh, for yeah. them to come here. Absolutely. Um, that's part of our whole idea of wanting to keep the French language here, right? Um, and it underpins a lot of the ideas that we're going to be talking about today as well, that exact same rhetoric for different, uh, from a different, slight, a slightly different perspective, but pretty much the same thing. Fucking rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> so right the thing is so france and quebec always have this interesting relationship and what happens in Kimezi's lifetime is that for the first time since france ceded canada to the british right, there is a french royal boat that actually comes to the shores of the saint lawrence now for a lot of people that might be completely benign right no one cares mm-hmm. about this boat called la capricieuse uh so literally capricious the the, however, this kind of represented this moment of hope for a lot of French Canadians and will actually be the subject of one of Kimezi's poems that we're going to be discussing a bit later. Right? So this ship comes in right around the time when the Second Empire is really in its full swing in France and in Europe. And so it gives this sense of romantic, uh, romanticized hope to a lot of French Canadians who are like, oh, you know, this this is what things used to be, right? We had this great dream of France holding on to us and caring about us mm-hmm. much more than what we see the English perceivably doing to us today. And so this is another thing that people tend to forget is that there is most certainly this tangible and material type of um, romanticism going on that's based in historical facts it's not just an imagined condition of whatever worker or a language barrier there are actually relations that are going on between france and quebec that feed into this right Right. it's a literal ghost of france that's haunting quebec it's kind of it's kind of really interesting that it it's kind of a well-timed arrival 
<laughs> I'm just imagining what that would look like. But I, I think it's an interesting analogy, right? It's kind of like this specter that's always hanging around a lot of what Quebec sees itself as. Oh, for sure. Right? And it plays right into this sentiment that Kim Izzy represents, right? In the quote that I was talking about at the beginning. So that a lot of when he talks about Canada, he most certainly explicitly is referring to French Canada, right? A lot of their ideas are based in this idealized past that France actually cared about them as more than a colony. Um, but yeah, yeah, but that's only really because it's been a couple hundred years since they were under French rule. Yep. Almost a hundred to be exact. Yep. I feel like if they knew, if they, if they had been more there, their, their, their golden times, nostalgic times are very rose tinted. Oh yeah, for sure. And I feel like well, we can get into it once we look at the poetry, but I feel like a lot of it is, uh, Kim Azzi is aware of it, right? He's aware that this is a rose tinted thing, but he's aware also of the power that this can hold on a lot of people. Right. Um, to kind for of sure. bring them together. Come together right, right now. now. Over me. Over me. <laughs> I know uh, I forgot to tell you that there were translations of the poems, but did you have time to look at them uh, a bit quickly before? Well, I also actually... found some other ones on my own just by okay. like trying to find what I could. Great. So exactly right so we'll talk directly about we'll have kind of two sections on kim Aizy. one his poetry directly which we're going to talk about now and one his bookstore which is a kind of extension of his poetry and then we're going to kind of wind down on his legacy so <laughs> um so obviously it's coming at a time when french canadian writing as little as it may be was considered a kind of low french it wasn't considered proper and highbrow french that the french produced back in europe and right, this shift towards an acceptance of French Canadian accents and speech hadn't happened yet. Right? Mm. So that's certainly not what we're finding in Kim Aziz's poetry. We're finding a very formalized version of French writing. Uh, so if you read his poems, which again will be linked, don't go in expecting anything that's purely Quebecois as we'd understand it today. It is mm -hmm. very much a French Canadian person writing as he sees the French writing. Um, and he's actually very much influenced by people like Victor Hugo, who was a contemporary. And he thought that it was pretty much the pinnacle of literature at the time. What works did you actually read of his? I found uh, In Memory of M. de Finue. Okay. And then uh, Le Canada. Okay. Um, yeah, those were the two that I found sort of online really easily. Absolutely. What did you think of them? What were your initial thoughts of his poetry? I like it. Again, okay. you know, people who've been listening to this show know that me and poetry have a relationship as rocky as the mountains. But for what <laughs> the, the, um, the, the things I saw, you know, there's, there's something to be said about somebody who's trying to write to capture the feelings of nostalgia. That's something okay. I gravitate towards a bit more, you know, this idea of memory and using poetry to connect memory. Mm-hmm. Is something that's a bit more for me. And I think that's, that's the two ones that I found. They're very related to memory. Like, again, in memory, it's in the title. And it's a mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, a lament for a friend. Uh, I guess, M. de Finue, would that be a madame or monsieur? Or He was actually a journalist and writer who was born in France and was one of the writers during the time when Kim Aizy was writing in the 1850s of the Journal de Québec. Mm -hmm. And he would actually be a professor of history and literature at, uh, Laval, uh, at uh, Laval School, right? which was one of the earlier schools in French Canada. Right? So he's kind of a, an academic and writer in this moment of transition for French Canada. Okay, cool. Right. So, interesting. but it, it's interesting, right, that you, that, that you bring that up, right? So the idea of memory is definitely one that you see. In most of his poems, you will see references to France, as we constantly mention. So this memory of glory and the memory of past uh, French, uh, French Canadians, right? That definitely shows mm -hmm. up. But even in Monsieur Fenouillet, um, which again, you can find for free online. Some of them are pretty long, by the way, the poems. Um, oh, for but, sure. You know, he's focusing on someone and you see that a lot in his writing and we'll see the circles that he, run, uh, that he runs in are very similar. 
he's focusing here on a type of person. And what I mean by that is a kind of intellectual class. Mm -hmm. He's very much pleased with people who can think and uh, provide thoughtful responses to the world around them. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, in a lot of his poetry, for example, the ones he's, the two he's best known for, sorry, are Le Vieux Soldat Canadien, literally the old Canadian soldier, and Le Drapeau de Carillon, the flag of Carillon, which is a fort um, at the south of Lake Champlain. So both of these Woo-hoo. also have a very, a very much a feel of focusing on the common population. Right? And very much feeling the plight of the either the soldier who was fighting through these things or just the general French Canadian person going through this plight uh, under the British. So it's very interesting that you have all of these elements that are kind of merging into relatively small poetic oeuvre, but one that's still considered very important. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because you, you look him up and you see that he's the father of French Canadian poetry. Mm-hmm. But so very few people would actually know of him. I didn't know anything about him. My mother, who had takes a day, great deal of pride in her knowledge of Canada and Quebec and the history of it, didn't know anything about him, really. Yeah. She only knew that there was a metro stop named after him. Mm-hmm. But then yeah. you take a look at it and you dig a little deeper. And it's kind of fascinating how big and the kind of life that this guy lived. It's kind of yeah. a little bit of crazy. It's kind of a little crazy. Absolutely. Is there anything in particular that you're referring to in this case or just? Oh, there's the bookstore and then the bookstore grew and then the bookstore failed. So he ran away to France. <laughs> yeah, we're, we'll get into that. There's a, <laughs> okay. It's a, it was very much like a, oh, he no. tried, he tried yeah. hard. <laughs> just in general, these big life changing decisions that he constantly went through, you know? And again, it's not anything crazier than some American poets and authors, but for, for a Canadian author, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's so I, I, I think it makes sense to talk about this here, right? So what so, so you see this father of French Canadian poetry and all that. How do you see that in the poems that you read, right? So in Le Canada, in Lettre uh, uh, à la mémoire de Monsieur Fenouillet, what what about it makes you think that he would scream French Canadian poetry more than other French Canadian poets that we might have covered in the past, or even just Canadian poets in general, right? Right. Why now? Is it because um, of the moment in which they're living in this weird transition? Is it because people are attaching themselves to, you know, something? It's like some kind of movement from what I've seen revolution in phase? his... Here's the thing, when I'm reading his poetry, because I've talked about this before, when we read a lot of the stuff that Canadians are putting forward about, when Canadians talk about Canada and they're trying to talk about the lyric, it almost seems like they're trying to sell it. Like they're trying to enforce this idea, like, no, we have a canon. Here it is. We are this thing and we have these spaces and we have our own set of, you know, they, they're, tra- they're trying to say they do. Kareem Z, when I read him, just feel, it just feels like he does. It just is. French okay. Canadian or Canadian. He's not trying to sell me on it. It is sim- it simply is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. He's just talking about he's just talking about a place that he loves. He's not trying to tell you. He's not trying to sell you to go to that place. Yeah. It to me it to also describe feel- it in a really bad way. Yeah. To me it also feels right. So we've <laughs> talked about other poets, especially during when we were talking about the rebellions of 1837-38. We were talking about poets during that time, but a lot of them felt like they were reacting to that specific moment of trying to promote sympathy or rejection of this kind of mass movement that was happening. The difference with Kemazi, and we'll we'll get into the details of his poems specifically, but it seems like he's actually understanding the profound nature of the world in which he lives in. Yes. There, like, for example... There's a, there's a very core belief in there. Mm-hmm, absolutely. If you look at, for example, the, the poem Le Vieux Sol de Canadien, so 1855, which you can find translated. If you don't read French, you can find it translated on the Historia Canadiana website, right? So Woo-hoo. he's talking in this poem about a veteran who served under Montcalm, who was a general during the war between the British and the French in the 1700s. And this veteran is dreaming of the day when the French flag will once again fly above the Quebec citadel, right? So this is during the time when exactly right, the Second Empire is forming. And so this man is hoping for the day that the emperor will send a fleet to retake New France. And <laughs> you're seeing this moment in which 
during the poem, he's just contemplating and looking out to the sea towards this grand open space towards France. He's looking at this from the citadel of Quebec. Right? This grand past. Absolutely. So you, you can see, for example, in a poem like that, right? He, the, the last stanza is really, I think, informative of this. And it comes back to this idea of memory that you're talking about. All the memories that fill his life fought for a place in his tender heart. Many, like the running tides before him, those weakened looks questioned the shore, seeing if the French that, in his native faith, hoping to see again since days gone by, came to fly their banners on our ramparts. ramparts. Then, finding the fire in his first pas- of his first passion, proud of his memories, he sang his hope. To me, this kind of demonstrates not only that the people themselves had an awareness of where they come from, right? And he's mm-hmm. interested in exploring that in his poetry, but it also shows that people act on it, right? And actually have a sense in which they want to express these feelings right? in a variety of ways. But in this case, the soldier is singing, right? Literally, he's finding this, uh, this strength in the past, whether it's glorified or not. And as we talked about, I think especially with the quote that I mentioned at the beginning, I think Kim Aizy is aware of this, that it's idealized, but it doesn't really matter because it helps this veteran get through the trauma that he's living, presumably under the British. And I think that is a very interesting reading. I I don't think I'm reading too much into this. Uh, Sometimes I tend to do that, but I don't think in this case I'm reading too much into this. But that, that was kind of what stuck out to me with this poem in particular is a profound awareness of the time and place in which he's living in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, you know, just to try and better articulate myself from earlier, mm-hmm. is he just writes like he wants to tell you about his passion, and his passion is French Canada. Mm-hmm. That's why his writing, I think, works so much better, and it's stuck so much more than the other ones we've seen here. There's, there's obviously going to be some sort of slant to it, but the political slant isn't the point of the poem. Mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. obviously he has nationalism he's he has nationalism in mind, but he's not trying to stoke that nationalism. He's just writing as a nationalist. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Right. I found that very little soaks into it. Yeah. I found very little information um about he seems like a complicated figure in terms of where his nationalism stands, right? It seems to have right. changed throughout his life. Um, or at least had more nuance or less nuance as he went along. But it's very interesting that you bring up nationalism because I don't think he was someone who advocated for a complete separation as we'd understand it today. I don't think he was a separatist, so to speak, of French mm-hmm. Canada. But I do think that he genuinely believed that the French could live as a distinct uh, sovereign people within the Canadian context. Right. Mm-hmm. I think he was very much interested in this idea that there was a glory in empire. Right, He bought into that hook, line, and sinker. Whether it's with the French, you see references to Napoleon and his glory all the time. Uh, he is someone who is very conservative in his worldview. <laughs> he thinks religion and aristocracy are something that are, should be maintained. Right, So you still get this very profound... Um, this very profound set of values that I think taint his populist uh, leadings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, That that would maybe push him towards a complete separatist uh, ideal, but it's still very interesting nonetheless. I get to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have a chance to read the uh, Drapeau de Carillon one? Or at least the the translation that I put on the website? A little bit. So uh, the, the, the other poem that I wanted to mention is the Drapeau de Carillon, right? The Flag of Carillon, which was written a few years after the old Canadian soldier in 1858. And this is what pretty much in the eyes of many people solidified uh, him as the national bard of Canada, so to speak. And so this is literally written a hundred years after the Battle of Carillon, which was a French victory against the British. And it's an homage to that battle. Yeah, I think it is. There's a very strong call for France and a very strong connection being established there. Mm-hmm. It's So I think that the first stanza really stands out to me, right? Where, again, this is my translation, but I think it, it captures some of the thing, right? Do you sometimes think of those glorious times where alone, abandoned by their mother France, our ancestors defended their victorious name and saw the invading army flee before them? Do you still regret the days of Carillon 
where under the white flag victory came, our fathers shrouded themselves in immortality and traced with their sword a heroic history. See, this stanza in and of itself, I think is indicative of Kim Aziz's kind of um, ambiguity about the remembrance of this past. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is he, he uses the term regret, right? In French, it's literally that, regrettez-vous, right? So there's a sense of heaviness about the responsibility of this memory that I think comes with a lot of his poetry. And it's something that I don't think many people have actually touched upon in the criticism, modern and contemporary to him, of Kim Aziz's poetry. People tend to view it as very romantic and idealized, but I think, mm. I think there is definitely something to it that he's kind of warning people that it's all well and fine, and it's definitely an, something that assembles people into this mass idea of what we could be, but there's a cost to it. There's a cost to this immortality, right? And that cost is that you risk staying the same for so long, right? Um, Right, you're literally tracing with a sword. It's traced in blood. It's traced in something very permanent, um, which I think is an important distinction to make with a lot of nationalist movements, right? Who tend to invent these ideas about the past and then really stick to them and go hard on them. I think there is a fluidity and flexibility in Kim Aziz's work that is not mentioned often enough. Right, for sure. I can definitely, for sure. Okay. Um, Yeah. So just moving on, because we've been talking for about an hour about (laughs) a bit, right? One last thing. A lot of it was Confederation. Yeah, that's that's cool. But I I do actually want to keep going on Kim Aziz. Uh, I had one last thing about his poems, and then we can kind of move on to his bookstore, which Mm -hmm. I think is another interesting part of his life. And something that directly relates to this cultural awakening that you see happening in Canada, right? So One of the things that I think made him so popular was that a lot of his songs were able, uh, were written in a style that allowed them to be played to music, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's a big way to sort of sell your music a bit more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or not sell your music, sorry, sell your poetry. Is you want, he has that sort of, it can be spread around quite quickly. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially even those longer poems or even aren't necessarily that much long. Does that make any sort of sense? Yeah, yeah. And then some of them, like Le Canada, is three stanzas? Yep. So it makes it, it, I think that's part of the reason why he got so popular so quickly is because you didn't need to have 20 pages to read him. Absolutely. And you didn't need to pay for 20 pages. (laughs) No. Although he certainly did try because his last poem, uh, which he was writing before, um, before he died, was supposed to be three parts. And he only managed to complete one. And that's uh, Promenade des Trois Morts. Uh, so literally the walk of three dead, the three dead, mm-hmm. uh, which is more of a fantasy lyrical poem. It's very interesting, by the way. He takes the perspective of the worm eating someone's body. It's quite macabre, but it's, I think, one of his underdog poems uh, and one that doesn't get enough attention. It's very, very interesting and definitely shows his interest in a kind of epic journey, right? Even if it is from the perspective of the dead and of the worm, it's definitely right. showing a sensibility for this long narrative that's being formed, right? Where even just part one is supposed to be about 30 pages, <laughs> which is <laughs> which tells you about how long he was planning it to be if that's just part one of three. But um, that whole idea of creating this long and intricate and very focused uh, and however very focused narrative i think is definitely something that needs to be mentioned in his interests so just to kind of cap off um just to kind of cap off right this um section on his poetry right it's it's very interesting to me right so he's considered he's there's something that goes right beyond the subject matter of his poems, right? He's kind of uh, uh, very much concerned with thinking about the past and the future simultaneously in this kind of patriotism. So we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that while he was considered a national bard, despite his very small output, that it's only post-Confederation that he would actually be collected into a full book, right? His, he would actually get well-known enough to warrant a collection of his poetry in the 1880s. 
It's kind of indicative to me of this weird moment that you simultaneously get a revival or a start to this French Canadian poetry, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't really take hold as much as maybe it seems to have in the case of having a national bard, right? It's only post-Confederation that his name is immortalized in a sense through his book. It's only after that that you get a full swing and full political swing into national movements in uh in quebec right so it's kind of interesting to me that despite his poetry being considered this forefather of french canadian poetry that it didn't quite have the patriotic impact as maybe having a name like National Bard of Canada would leave anyone to assume. Right. Well, that's the other part of why it's so funny that like nobody knows who he is, but then he's called National Bard of Canada. Do you think there's a reason for that? I don't know. Like, um, Some might listen to this and might claim some sort of discrimination against French Canada. And there might be a little bit of that going on, but that might be more, that might be more because the actual content of his poems are calling for France yeah. than they are Canada. You know, he's calling mm-hmm. his, his, the Carillon, Trappe de Carillon is all caught talking about waiting out to see if somebody's going to come and save New France. Yeah. So that's probably a reason why he faded a bit, is that when, you're, when it came time to create a national Canadian identity, you're not going to talk about the guy who wants you to be reconquered by your original founders. Right. It, it's this really weird dichotomy, right? So I'm kind of preceding myself, but right, even on the year of Confederation in 1867, Kimazi commented on French Canadian literature mm-hmm. and he was saying, I'm translating on the fly here. I have a French uh, paragraph, right? But he's, he's saying what's lacking in Canada is having a language of its own. And again, Canada in this case is French Canada. Mm-hmm. If we spoke Huron or Iroquois, our literature would live. A bit contentious of a statement, but okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, we talk and write in a piteous fashion. It's true. The language of Bossuet and Racine, we speak it poorly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we tend to talk a lot and try things, but from a literary point of view, we're still a simple colony. Okay. So that's, uh, again, I was translating on the fly here, but that's basically the gist of what he was saying. And it's interesting to me that he would say that, but still very much, as you say, be enamored by this French <laughs> style, right? It's, it's this weird <laughs> duality that happens with him, um, where it almost seems like he's, he knows that it's a necessary step to take. You want to simultaneously give someone what they're familiar with, that mm-hmm. is French poetry, but move things forward and by at least addressing subject matter that would be relevant to some people. I, I don't know. It's I'm thinking of this as I'm going along. I don't necessarily have an answer, but I just thought it was this weird dichotomy that was happening. Mm-hmm. Anyway, if you have nothing else to say about his poetry, or if you have final thoughts, go for it. But we can move on to his bookstore, which I think it, it won't take as long as what we've been talking about currently, but I think it's an important step to talk about. I mean, that's the most interesting part. The fact that he got this, created this well-known bookstore, had it all, lost it all, because it was just a really funny story of this guy in his bookstore. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you got to that point in the in the notes, but his bookstore because of its place, right, as something that had books from Europe, right, which is something that very few people had at the time, or not an entire bookstore's worth, it was kind of a meeting place for a lot of intellectuals, right? So in the backstore of his bookstore, you would have people like two professors from the Université de Laval who... Uh, namely Abbé Jean-Baptiste Antoine Ferland and François-Alexandre Hubert Larue. You had the superintendent of public education for Lower Canada, Chauvreau, the editor of the conservative newspaper, The Coyotes Canada, who's Joseph uh, Charles Dashi. Like mm-hmm. These names today v- mean very little for us in a modern Quebec and Canadian setting. But all these people were actually very important and high up at the time in lower Canadian and Eastern Canadian society, right? So you had this kind of group that was forming in the backstore of this very, uh, not I don't want to say avant-garde bookstore, but certainly one that allowed for a great mixity of ideas, um, that, that, that allowed for this, right? And I find this absolutely fascinating. Right. You even had 
you even had uh, Louis Fréchette, who was a very well-known writer at the time. Um, Alfred Garneau, who is the son of the quote-unquote national historian, François Xavier Garneau. Mm -hmm. All of these were a group of people who would get together in the bookstore and talk about the state of French Canadian literature. And I think that's an important piece in the puzzle of understanding why Crémazy is better known today or at least is better known as a national bard. Not necessarily right. because his things were innovative, but that he was at the forefront of a group who cared, right? Um, and he was at the center and at, at this focal point in a group of people for whom they took this stuff seriously, right? Um, and they were actually known as the Mouvement Littéraire de Québec, which literally translates to the literary movement of Quebec City. And they are kind of recognized historically today as really instigating and pushing forward French Canadian letters and um, at this national literature. So despite them being very much influenced by the French Romantic movement, they kind of put forward this idea that French Canadian literature could be something that stand on, uh, stands on its own, right? Um, I don't know if you had anything to say about that, but I wanted to bring it up as at least the fact that a, his bookstore became a moving uh, meeting point. Yeah, or like this focal point for a movement that got much bigger than perhaps anyone in that sphere maybe expected. Right. Well, it's like you said before, his bookstore is founded on imports, bringing in things from... So it, was, it makes sense that would become this place of intellectual discussion. Mm -hmm. More to the point, this is the 1850s. Yep. In 1840s, it's not like new ideas are going to be accepted. It's not like people are going to want to bring in things from the beyond point, yep. you know, from beyond their borders. So the fact that he did this, he, he was setting himself up, whether intentionally or not, to become a hot spot of discussion and debate because he yep. had the ideas that nobody else had. Like, I don't mean he had the ideas, but he had the books with the ideas that nobody else had. I think this kind of represents one of the reasons why you know, we were saying, so Octave Kimazi is kind of remembered and was collected in the 1880s, right? And a lot of what we understand as true blue French Canadian poetry as something that stands on its own, or French blue Canadian blue. poetry, happened in the 1880s. Is because, you know, the people who form these groups are higher ups, are intellectuals, they're writers, right? Who have this idea of changing people's minds and changing attitudes through literature. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, Kimaisi himself is noted, right, to what is this monster that frightens so many worthy people? Uh, it's the, he says, the 89 of literature, the 1789 of literature. So the French Revolution of literature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's all the ideas, all the things trampled underfoot without reason and by the privileged form of the classic school, which are coming to claim their place in the literary sun. So you have this group of people who are trying to advance change, but are doing it through a medium that is inherently slow to enact change, right? It's not by a gunpoint or anything like that. So it makes sense within that context, I think, that if this is the kind of movement that you're promoting, which definitely has its merits, it's certainly going to take some time, though. I think this is a very useful piece of the puzzle in general. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as you're saying, the bookstore is more of a funny tragedy, a farce, if you will. Well, it's also the, the reason he goes to France. Yeah. It's important to know with Crema is he, his poetry was secondary in his life, mm -hmm. which Absolutely. is probably why it comes off as so sincere. It's not something that he does to make a living or he's not trying. That's why it doesn't kind of ever come off as it's ingenuous because it's just something he's doing on his own time. Mm -hmm. Much like Absolutely. this podcast. <laughs> No, no, but I, I, I see what you mean, right? It's, he, he, his passion was his bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, and as we kind of alluded to, it ends in tragedy because to, in order to keep it alive and to finance it, he made some really shady deals and ended up in a uh, getting charged with fraud and stuff like that. So he ended up having to flee to France, after which he neither had a bookstore and he was living off stipends from his brother and he never wrote another poem in his life. So mm -hmm. neither of his passions, secondary as they may be to his bookstore, ever fully realized. It's kind of one of those things in which you are forced to wonder how much he would have been able to develop things because he was relatively young when he went to France. It's important, it's, it's kind of fun to think about what could have been with his literature. How much would he have actually innovated considering <laughs> his attitudes if he had been allowed or had wanted to continue? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, 
I don't know. It's, I, I think it's an interesting point. Like we think today of his poetry, or at least we're, we've been concentrating a lot on his poetry, but I'm actually curious. No, I mean, I, I was going to ask, why do you think his bookstore would have been primary and not his poetry considering the quotes that he read? But I think that's just a personal choice. Uh, oh yeah. A hundred percent. It means again, if you're doing your hobby, you're not doing it really for anybody else. So you're going to be a lot more honest about it which is where the strong core of his poetry comes from. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, no, go ahead. No, just again, the a lack of politics arose from the fact that because he wasn't writing to be political. Absolutely. At least I don't think so. I mean, it gets back to the conversation we were having about Margaret Atwood on the last episode. It, mm -hmm. How much, despite, despite the fact that he's not explicitly taking a political stance on current subjects, how much of it, you know, would have influenced a lot of the minds at the time, right? You're mm -hmm. still promoting ideas. In his own words, you're promoting ideas and thoughts, which are, according to him, much scarier than anything else you could do. Um, so I don't know if there isn't an explicit political aim here. Even in his bookstore, he's bringing in these exotic ideas from Europe, right? Now, mm -hmm. he wasn't successful in doing so because <laughs> his, his bookstore went bankrupt, but the idea remains the same, right? Um, For sure. Yeah. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to add about the bookstore or the poems? Or can we um, kind of cap off? No, I think that's about it. If you want to see a statue of him, you can. That's true. Where is it again? It is, hold on. Probably hold on, in Quebec on. City. Yeah, Montreal, St. Oh, really? Louis Square. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I only knew that he had the street because I live near it, but, and the metro station. Oh, cool. I might actually yeah. go visit that. The statue depicting a French Canadian soldier stands in Montreal, St. Louis Square with Cremezi's name across the top in the years 1827 to 1879. Wow. Underneath the soldier are the words, Pour mon drapeau, je viens ici mori. For my flag, I come here to die. Yep. Absolutely. So as a kind of way to conclude, Right. So he went, as we keep alluding to, he, his store went bankrupt in 1862. He goes to France, he changes his name, and he dies a few years later um, bum bum. in Le Havre. It's, it's interesting, right, that we keep alluding to the fact that his legacy has just kind of withered away. Mm -hmm. right? And I was reading up on that in preparation for this show. And it's interesting, right, because the modern consensus around his art is less that it has a certain quality to it. And for his patriotic and national poems, I can definitely see that. I can see why for some people it just doesn't cut it in terms of great art, but that's a subject of interpretation and you can have various opinions <laughs> about that. But uh, I, I definitely think that some of his works have merit. If you want to look up, I think some of his best stuff is his lyric poems. And the one I mentioned before, Promenade des Trois Morts, is, I think, in my opinion, quite beautiful. Um, and just for a historical perspective, I think it's very interesting to note these kinds of things. But for a lot of people, it's interesting for, for me that the modern criticism is more about the fact that he represents this inability to become fully realized as a poet right, in right. Canada. Right? That's what most critics point to today is just like this inability to live off of a cultural life back then. Right? Whereas in the States, we constantly mention it as this kind of dynamic place. You could, it, would, it didn't happen often, but you could definitely live much more easily off of a life of art and writing than you could in Canada at this time. Um, and that's kind of what sticks out most to people today. That being said, I think that he should definitely still have a place within the canon that is discussed. Um, oh, 100%. Just for, e even if it is for this kind of meta, um, this meta observation of him as representing this inability to grow as an artist and to be an artist in Canada at the time, I think he deserves attention and he deserves um, at least a footnote in history, right? Um, <laughs> which is not something that I think we get a lot of today. Yeah. Did you have any maybe uh, concluding thoughts? About his, his bookstore, him, his poetry. All of it. All of it at once. Conclude it all in one sentence. <laughs> Vive le Québec. There you Vive go. Vive la France. Vive le Québec libre. <laughs> I mean, essentially, I'm pretty sure he'd be a very big fan of uh, President Charles de Gaulle. Oh, 
most certainly. <laughs> but oh yeah, I wanted to bring up the only thing I wanted to mention, right? Because we mentioned at the start of the episode that it kind of offered for me a different perspective on Durham, right? Mm-hmm. I, the only thing I meant by that, I didn't bring it up when we talked about it at directly, all. but one of Durham's things was that, and he put it again in a way that was hugely insulting and still, as we know, sticks with a lot of French Canadians to this day is that, you know, Lower Canada was a place without culture and without history. Right. And part of what he was saying was very much in line with what Kim Azi is saying, that you'd think that it was a place that had stayed in this kind of backwater time uh, right. of the Middle Ages. Now, I don't think Durham was taking into consideration the historical and material realities that made them so, right? Because of the Catholic Church, because of the way the British kept the French Canadians down in those positions. But... I do think that it offers an interesting insight that, you know, decades after Durham arrives, his statement, in a sense, still resonates and resonates with French Canadians themselves, which I think offered, again, if not a perspective I agree with necessarily, but certainly one that I can get a new insight into. Yeah, I don't know if you had anything to say about that, but I just wanted to mention that before we uh, before well, we. That sounds end. about good. Does this tell you anything about? Like, does this give you, I think, a relevant understanding of where this puzzle is? Does Kim Azee himself, as a figure and a writer, give you a relevant piece of the puzzle for French Canada going into Confederation, or do you think he's kind of this outlier that? represents both good and bad figures that is just kind of there i think in the end we don't know french canada for its poetry it's not like their poets are world renowned uh, at least not at that time yeah no (laughs) but i think he did play an important role you know and anybody who gets a statue of boulevard in a metro station named after them had to leave kind some kind of legacy behind i'll absolutely agree with that and it kind of to me it kind of shows kim isaiah at least kind of shows this willingness to be different within a system that doesn't necessarily allow you to be. Right. Right. I think that for me in modern times and with a bit of hindsight, looking back on the Confederation project and Quebec's place in it and French Canadians place in it, I think that's the biggest takeaway with his work. Not only does he represent the attempt to, to, to kind of move forward, but just, yeah, this kind of weird duality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Mac, why don't you tell people once again how they can support this lovely show in which we power through the incredible heat of something that is certainly not due to global warming because, of course, that is a myth. Hold on. Let me get the the pre-written speech out. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for listening. You can reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns on the Facebook page, through Twitter, and by email. You can support the show through PayPal as a pay what you feel the show is worth and through affiliate links in the record recommended reading page I set up. You can find perks like extra and ad-free episodes on Patreon. Anyway, all this (laughs) is optional and the show will still remain free and independent. Finally, if you could leave a review on iTunes and share with some friends, it would be very appreciated. It helps to boost the show and get it to more people's ears. For now, I'll just say that I wish you all excellent health and I hope you and your loved ones can stay safe in these intense times. We'll see you next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers! Wow, that was absolutely lovely. (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for listening, honestly. And we'll see you next time to talk about a different perspective on this side of the pre-Confederation coin. We're going to be talking about Charles Sangster. And I'm really excited. Yay! Um, Because we actually talked about him in a class I had with Daniel O'Leary. Oh, yep, fun. Anyway, see you next time. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone.